All right, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. A quick note, today's session is being recorded. Please feel free to turn off your camera if you would not like to be on the recording. Uh, we have a lot to cover, so we're gonna jump right in and get started. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, today's coordinators and host are myself, I'm Tammy Diaz. I am a school nurse specialist with the Maine Department of Education Coordinated School Health Team. We are going to have Lauren Hunt from Maine General Medical Center presenting this afternoon as well. Um, she is the Harm Reduction Program Coordinator at Maine General. And Susan Berry is gonna be sharing her knowledge uh, she is the health education and health promotion specialist, also on the coordinated school health team at the Maine Department of Education. Can you share your screen, Tammy? <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, thank you for letting me know. Is that better? Are you seeing them? Yes, we are. Thank you. One second. I'm sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. All right, let me try this again. I want to go walking with whoever's got the beautiful outdoor view here. Sorry about this. And for those who have just joined us, because we've had several folks join, please um, add to the chat box, your name, your district, and position for us. We can see who we have on the call and if you're school or agency. All right. Okay. I think I'm on now. Can everyone see the slides? Yep. Yes, we're good. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for your patience too with getting that sorted. Um, we would like to recognize the collaboration between the Maine Department of Education, Office of School and Student Supports, Maine Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Behavioral Health, and the Maine General Medical Center Harm Reduction Team for bringing this webinar to all of you today. As we begin, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we will respond to these questions at the end of the presentation or in the summary that is distributed following today's presentation. And a quick note about our mission and vision here at the Department of Education. Um, it is the mission of the and vision of the Department, uh, Maine Department of Education to promote the best learning opportunities for all Maine students by providing information guidance and support to our schools, educators, and leaders, and by providing adequate and equitable school funding and resources. The overview for today, um, the format, uh, we will include a brief review of the updates to chapter 41, then take a deeper look into harm reduction and services available in central Maine and around the state to support harm reduction. We will discuss opioid overdose and the Loxone administration and conclude with reviewing alignment with health education standards and resources. So why are we talking about this? With recent updates to chapter 41, equipping school staff with a more in-depth understanding of harm reduction services available including opioid overdose and naloxone administration, you will be better prepared 
to support your school communities and provide appropriate education for students and staff in your schools. Um, looking at chapter 41, one of the, um, the original version of this rule required public schools to offer training to students on how to perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation and the use of automated external defibrillators or AEDs. The rule was updated during the 131st legislative session to include training related to naloxone hydrochloride administration or other FDA approved overdose prevention nasal spray by secondary students. That was a mouthful. Um, for the purpose of today's presentation, updates related to chapter 41 being reviewed will focus on the addition of naloxone education. So looking at the standards of naloxone um, hydrochloride training, the standards are that uh, training on administration of naloxone um, nasal spray or other FDA approved overdose prevention will be offered as in, uh, extracurricular instruction. Training should include initiating emergency response services, recognition of possible overdose dose, and actions to take to reverse it. So talking about a qualified instructor, who can teach naloxone administration? This is a question that I think a lot of um, educators and even some of our school nurses and school staff have, right? Um, what is a qualified educator? A qualified educator for opioid-related overdose response should have, one, knowledge of substance use prevention, and two, must have knowledge of naloxone hydrochloride nasal spray or other FDA approved overdose prevention nasal spray administration education, which we will be reviewing here today. It is recommended that instructors be CPR and AED certified. And if you are not CPR certified and would like to be, we will be sharing resources in the follow-up communications. a little more from chapter 41. Um, let's talk about education standards. Uh, to ensure that the, um, I'm sorry, let's talk a little bit about education standards. The education must be aligned to national opioid response guidelines adopted by organizations that offer research-based training and best practice. So what does this mean? Examples of organization that offer research-based training and best practice would um, be organizations like the National Institutes of Health, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, otherwise known as SAMHSA, or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. These are all examples of, of organizations that um, have evidence-based research-based uh, resources for education. Uh, these organizations also often inform and serve as, um, as a resource for schools, uh, for healthcare organizations, and um, for states. And I am going to hand it over to Lauren Hunt from Maine General. We're gonna transition from talking about chapter 41 to discuss harm reduction, naloxone administration. And I'd like to give a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Lauren Hunt from Maine General. Thank you so much. Perfect. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for taking the time to be for being here today. You could go to the next slide, please. Perfect. My name, like Tammy said, is Lauren Hunt. I'm the Harm Reduction Program Coordinator for Maine General's Harm Reduction Program. Born and raised in Maine, I have been in this role 
were working in this field for the past two years. And then prior to that, did some adolescent behavioral health and then worked in the public schools in Massachusetts. Next slide, please. Great, so we're here today to help support um, the rollout of this training abilities and offerings in Maine schools. Um, like Tammy and Susan said, please feel free to put questions in the chat throughout today. This is heavy material. I completely understand that. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and if not, we'll follow up after today's presentation. The focus of today, like has been mentioned, is on opioids um, overdose and opioid overdose response. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be talking briefly about what harm reduction really means, what that looks like in the community, and then touching on opioids at large, what those overdose risk factors are, signs and symptoms of the overdose itself, overdose response, and some specifics around that, um, and then closing with the Good Samaritan Law, um, which actually is the number one law in the country as far as Good Samaritan Laws go. Next slide, please. Perfect. So with that, this is um, the definition of harm reduction. Um, it's all about reducing the negative consequences associated with drug use, most notably fatal overdose and risk of infection. We do this work um, being guided by four different philosophies. So the most important one being meeting folks where they're at. That could look like working with somebody in active use to get them services that they need um, to be safer in what they're doing. That could look like working with schools to get Narcan on hand um, and get folks trained so they know how to respond and feel comfortable responding. It really depends on the person you're working with, where they are, what they have access to, et cetera. It's a non-judgmental and non-coercive approach, meaning we are not judging people for their behaviors. Um, that doesn't do any good for the person and often does harm, um, in fact. We're not being coercive, meaning we're not telling folks what they should be doing. Again, that doesn't do any good. Um, and then lastly, the understanding that drug use in itself is complex. Um, people are in use for different reasons. People's pathways to recovery, if they are in use, look very different person to person. Um, and we're, our job is to be here to support and help folks be as safe as possible in their day to day. And then part of this work is also around educating folks, regardless of substance use disorder history, on the real harm and danger associated with drug use. Um, and then lastly, as you can see bolded here on the slide, substance use disorder itself does not discriminate. It can happen to anybody. Um, and our job here working in the field is to help folks be prepared if they're not within it. And then if they are to help um, support and offer uh, services, et cetera, when that opportunity allows. Next slide, please. Here is just how this work translates in the field. So the goal of today is really, or this part of the slide deck at least, is to just show what we're doing. Um, if this is of interest to folks, if they know folks that could utilize these services, please, please reach out. Word of mouth is really powerful in this field. We're happy to help and offer these services where we can and link folks um, if we're not the best spot for them. If this doesn't apply to you, that's okay too, but we'll just take a quick second to talk about some other services that we offer. So these are some examples, syringe service programs. We have two, one is in Augusta and one is in Waterville. Those are needs-based free and anonymous services for anyone over the age of 18. We do out, so, um, excuse me, outreach resource tabling. So that could be setting up shop really anywhere that will have us. An example, our local YMCA's um, we go and offer harm reduction resources, but also hygiene bags, wound care kits that anybody could use. Um, overdose prevention education games is my favorite part of the job. Um, and we take that all over the place as well. It's a more fun um, way to learn about stuff that's not so fun to talk about sometimes. An example of that is in correctional facilities and we started and look and we have started and are looking into offering it more at schools as well. Uh, Narcan training at large, connecting folks to different services. You can see some examples there, treatment, um, other resources, et cetera. We do some stigma and reduction, stigma reduction trainings, and we incorporate those into others as well, because that is the number one barrier for folks accessing treatment when they're battling substance use disorder. Um, HIV and Hep C testing, we can offer that for free to anybody interested, and we're happy to come anywhere for that. 
And then lastly, the resource allocation piece, which includes hygiene bags and wound care kits, and that can be offered to anyone for free as well. Next slide, please. Just quickly, those are then some of those um, you can see within the hats that we serve at large, but just to see as a program specifically, um, if again, if any of these are in of interest to you, please reach out um, and we're happy to set that up. Next slide. Great. And then from there, these are the service areas or the counties within the service area that we serve, these nine counties of Midcoast and Central Maine. However, if you do not fall in this county, that is okay. Um, we're more than happy to link you to our counterparts in other parts of the state as well. Next one. These are what are called tier one um, hubs or catchment areas. We are the tier one distributor of, nalox of nasal naloxone or Narcan. Um, like I said, for those nine counties of Midcoast and Central Maine, Bangor Public Health is our counterpart for the Northern counties and then Portland Public Health takes Cumberland and York counties. Additionally, we work with Maine Access Points, which is a technically another tier one distributor who focuses more on um, peer distribution. But at large, the four of us work um, with varying numbers of different organizations within these areas to have access to Narcan for either um, have on hand emergency method or to do direct community distribution themselves. And we're happy to come and train sites in those areas as well. Next one, please. Just quickly, if your school is interested and does not yet have Narcan, that first link there will link you to what's called getmainnaloxone.org. It's essentially like a quick Google sheet. You just fill it out. And then based on your location, you'll get matched to the right person who will then help you complete that process. Um, and then the second link is for the options program. These, this is a state funded program where there are liaisons, one or several in every county and they do harm reduction work at large. So they can help folks with additional resources, whether that's prevention, treatment, you name it. Um, and that's a great site to then look into some more information there. Next slide, please. And then additionally, another resource if of interest to our syringe service programs around the state. These are syringe service or needle exchange locations, but they also do more than just syringe service. So that includes HIV, hep C testing, other harm reduction services, um, resource allocation, connection to treatment and other needed resources for um, daily living, et cetera. So feel free to check that out. And if any questions come up, don't hesitate to reach out there. Next one, please. And then just a quick FYI on today, the language you'll see aside from two slides, I believe, um, naloxone will be referred to as Narcan. Narcan is a brand form of intranasal naloxone or the naloxone that goes up the nose. That is what we distribute. Um, and so that's what we'll be talking about in terms of training today. Next one. Perfect, so let's dive in. Here is just a quick example of how we have started the conversation with students. Um, our program would like to thank Hebron Academy for being the pilot school for this work. Um, as we started to develop this content today, we had a great group of students who went through this training um, and we did some different exercises along the way. Here's an example of how we started the conversation. Um, you can see the bottom there, one word that comes to mind when you hear of harm reduction. That was the icebreaker that we used. Do you wanna to go to the next one? From there, apologize that this is hard to read, was a word collage that came from those students' responses. Um, I safe to say I was in goosebumps just hearing these um, first responses and that was before we had any discussion on what was to come that day. Um, so students are incredibly powerful um, and carry a lot of great meaning. And as a result, they were really excited to go into the field feeling more prepared in their day to day. And if you're interested in using this resource to build one, if you are looking to do this trainer training, excuse me, I'm happy to link you to that as well. Next one. This too is another example of how to start the conversation. Um, from that icebreaker, we then went into this just quick overview. Can you name an opioid? Have you heard of any? Um, so there's an idea if you're interested in using that. But here into the actual content. So if you can see here is a list of common opioids um, ranging from both uh, illicit and licit substances, methadone, 
are methadone and um, buprenorphine, which is not here, are common MAT or MOUD, which are medication-assisted treatments for opioid use disorder. Heroin and fentanyl are common illicit substances or illicit opioids within communities of folks in active use. Um, and then there's some other ones there as well. Illicit drugs at large are drugs that are illegal to possess and can be very addicting. When you have excess consumption of these or dependency on them, they can impact overall health, mental well being, and in many cases, the well being of others. Like I said, fentanyl and heroin are common within our communities with folks that we're working with. Fentanyl really overtaking heroin completely now. Um, it is star here for two reasons. Number one, it is much stronger than anything else out there. You can see how high the potency is. That being said, if you do not have a tolerance to these drugs and you knowingly or unknowingly ingest it, your, your risk of overdose is very high. Um, and then the second piece is around the duration. It lasts less time in somebody's system than other opioids or other medications. So even if you do have a tolerance um, and say you're a user of fentanyl, you have to use more frequently to get the same effects. And every time you use, you increase risk of overdose. So having to use more frequently would then increase that risk. Next slide, please. With that, what is an overdose? Um, an overdose is a toxic amount of a substance in somebody's system happening one of two ways. Either they've taken too much of one substance or they're mixing substances causing an adverse or negative reaction. Um, this is happening more and more, unfortunately. Um, we hear a lot of folks that we work with who are in active use that they are taking a drug, for example, and they may think it's one thing and it actually is one or several different things. Um, for example, cocaine. We've had a conversation with somebody that's in treatment um, and they had to take a urine test and it popped for four or five different drugs when they really thought it was just one. So really the message there is unfortunately everything is in everything now as far as illicit substances go. And this mixing piece is leading to a lot um, of overdoses. So it's just important to note this. An opioid overdose in particular targets the respiratory system. So somebody's ability to breathe. So with an overdose, your breathing would slow to stop, potentially causing heart and brain um, damage and then death if action is not taken. Next one, please. Risk factors. There's a list here. So taking high doses of opioids on a daily basis, taking more opioids than prescribed. This is a risk factor for anybody, regardless of substance use disorder history. Say you've had a procedure and you are in a lot of pain, so you treat it like aspirin or Tylenol and take a couple instead of that one dose. There's your risk. Um, or if you forgot that you've taken your dose that day and go to take it again, that could be a risk. Um, taking any illegal or illicit substance such as heroin or fentanyl, previous overdose in the past, reduced tolerance. So those are folks that have used previously. And then the big three are jail, hospitalization, and rehab. If you enter these facilities and then go to leave and try to use in the same way you may have previously, your body is no longer likely ready for that. Um, mixing substances, like I said, this is a huge issue um, in today's world. So mixing opioids with any other substance, um, alcohol, stimulants, et cetera. Taking medications containing a sedative along with an opioid. There's something called xylazine or the street name Trank um, in illicit drug supply now. And I'll talk quickly about what that looks like because it is in Maine now, um, just so you're aware and have a little bit of information about it. Being at risk for respiratory distress for any pre-existing respiratory related condition sleep apnea, um, asthma, emphysema, et cetera, puts you at further risk just because it targets that respiratory area, kidney disease, and then being over the age of 65. Next slide, please. Here's just that quick note on xylazine. So xylazine is a veterinary drug used, for, used as a sedative for very large animals. Um, unfortunately, it's now laced in illicit drug supply. We're hearing it become more and more common. It started in Philadelphia about a decade ago and has now made its way up the coast. For humans, it's a central nervous system depressant. Um, and essentially the human body does not want it in it. So it's gonna try to get it out in any way it can. Um, and so with that comes open wounds. They can start blister size and then grow. They take quite a long time to heal. Um, and unlike other 
wounds that we think of on a day to day, you're supposed to keep them moist and covered um, instead of drying them out. So with that, early and consistent wound care is crucial to manage them and we're here to help. Um, we can educate and connect folks to resources if this is ever an issue that were to come up. Next one, please. So from a harm reduction point of view, um, I felt it was important today to just keep this slide in here, completely understand if schools do not use this, but just so you are aware, um, coming from harm reduction, we're a safer, not safest approach. So obviously the ideal situation would be not using drugs, but if it is happening, if you know folks that are using it, really encouraging um, folks to have Narcan on hand in case of emergency. This goes for anyone, regardless of substance use, because we can all be good Samaritans. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the only way to know what you're using is to test with that, meaning we have test strips available for both fentanyl and xylazine. They're free of charge for community members that need them. So please reach out if that's of need. Um, and then lastly, the most important thing aside from Narcan is never using alone and spreading this message. The biggest reason being that if you were to be alone and were to overdose, there would be nobody there to help you. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, and I forgot to mention, just quickly there, if you have other questions about that messaging, about substance use, about prevention, et cetera, we're happy to connect you, connect you excuse me, to your local drug-free communities partners. They're great resources, um, and we can continue to have these conversations and offer follow-up resources, et cetera. So why carry Narcan? This goes for all of us. Um, here's an, a quick example of why. In 2022, um, 10, about a little over 10,000 overdoses were reported in Maine. These are reported overdoses, meaning that they had to be called in in some way. Um, of those 10,000 reported, there were 716 fatal overdoses. 716 and 10,000 are very different numbers. Um, Narcan saves lives every day. This number, 10,110, is likely a lot less than what was actually happening. So regardless, um, having Narcan in communities is saving lives every single day. Next slide, please. Going into actual overdose, what that looks like. So these are common signs and symptoms. The number one reported sign or symptom of an overdose from observers is this heavy snoring noise informally referred to as a death rattle. It can sound like somebody sleeping. Um, so if you ever were to see somebody that would be quote unquote taking a nap in a place they likely wouldn't be, important to check in to make sure they're okay. Breathing becomes kind of altered wheezy sounding from there that unusual sleepiness or unresponsiveness completely happens. Um, breathing becomes slow and absent, excuse me, or absent, slow heartbeat. It'll be hard to find a pulse, slow blood pressure, skin becomes cold and clammy to the touch, pupils become pinpoint, and then extremities, um, including nails and lips will turn blue. It could also appear to be gray depending on the individual. Next slide, please. Just touching on the actual progression again. So the breathing will slow to stop, potentially causing heart and brain damage and death if action is not taken. Next slide. So with that, what is naloxone? This is that drug name for Narcan. Um, and how does it work? Naloxone is an opioid antagonist, meaning it fights against opioids on the receptors in your brain. It was a prescription medication that is now available over the counter, meaning you can go and buy it. However, there are several ways to get it for free. It's quite expensive, um, roughly $45, $50 a kit for two doses. So we encourage getting it in other ways if cost is at all a barrier. Naloxone is non-addictive and unscheduled, meaning you cannot get high from it, nor can you overdose from it. It's very, very user-friendly. In fact, if you were to squirt it in your nose right now and you do not have opioids in your system, you would just feel a misty spray um, and nothing else would happen. So super, super user-friendly. In the intranasal form, like I briefly talked about, um, it is called Narcan, or this is a brand of intranasal naloxone called Narcan. The picture of it there is exactly what it looks like. And then lastly, um, this bullet is here because in conversation with folks in that of education that we do in the communities. People think it's a new medication. In fact, it's not. It's been used by decade, been used for decades by EMS services. 
Um, and although it has been traditionally used by first responders and emergency medical services, lay people um, can easily be trained like you all are today in emergency situation response. Next slide, please. Continuing naloxone um, is only effective with opioids, meaning it will only reverse an opioid overdose. Um, that being said, if you suspect overdose for whatever the reason may be, please still use um, naloxone because you will not cause any additional adverse effects on the individual if they are not overdosing um, from opioids and or if they are experiencing some other kind of health event, it's not going to hurt them anymore. So when in doubt, if you suspect overdose for whatever the reason may be, use that Narcan if you have it. Um, and like I believe we talked about, unfortunately, everything is mixed these days. So the likelihood that an opioid is present is pretty high. The most important thing to take away from overdose response training today is this next bullet here. It does take two to three minutes after administration to take effect, meaning you want to administer that dose, which we'll talk about in a second, and then wait two to three minutes before you give somebody another dose. Giving them additional do doses during that two to three minutes does not do anything to speed up the process. That's a very important um, component of this. And then second most important thing is that it does wear off 30 to 90 minutes after administration, which number one is why it's so important to call 911 so that somebody else um, that is trained to do so can come and give that person some additional help. Um, the reason really being regardless that somebody can revert entirely, be responsive if you've given them Narcan, be talking, et cetera, and then go back completely into overdose. Um, and so this is really important to know in response. Next slide, please. Just quickly looking at how it works in the brain. So like I said, Narcan or naloxone is an opioid antagonist. Opioids themselves act like a key in a lock. They bind to receptors. When there's too many of these opioids on your receptors, your breathing stops altogether. Naloxone has a stronger bind than opioids. So it comes and literally bumps those opioids off the receptors and takes their place. In doing so, you have restored breathing and saved somebody's life. That being said, they will be an immediate withdrawal from those opioids, which is important to know. And we'll talk a little bit about what that would look like when somebody wakes up um, in a second. Next slide, please. A quick note on Narcan storage. So um, it should be stored at room temperature, roughly 60 to 80 degrees. That is best practice. This is best practice because the medication can freeze below freezing temperatures. If it were to freeze, um, you would have to warm it between your hands to then use it. Um, and that just takes time and time and emergency response is never a good thing. Um, and then some studies show that the efficacy can change after about 115 degrees, which all in all goes to show why we encourage folks to keep it at room temperature if possible. Um, additionally, it should be protected from direct sunlight. And then after manufacturing, the kits are good for three years. Um, however, we have heard many folks that have used it when it is expired, but that is not what we're here to promote. So if it does near expiration, please let us know. We're happy to come and get it and offer it to folks that would use it much more frequently um, and get you a new kit if that is ever an issue for you. Next slide, please. So going into actual response. Next slide. Here are these steps of response all laid out, and then we will walk it through one by one and then watch a quick video on it just to um, add a little repetition into your afternoon. So quickly checking for signs of responsiveness. You're noticing those signs and symptoms. Um, when I do like small group trainings, I have folks raise their hand and share the symptoms where there's so many of us today. Um, I'll just reiterate some of those, but there's a, an example of something that you could do with students. So again, you're going to feel cold and clammy skin to the touch. Pupils will be pinpoint. You might hear some like really heavy snoring noises. Um, breathing will be slow. Extremities will be blue or turning blue, et cetera. So from there, you're going to check for response either on the chest bone here um, or if uh, they're laying flat on their belly, for example, the philtrum rub might be a better option, which is between um, the nose and the lip. It's called a philtrum rub. Um, and pushing there. If you push there on yourself, it's uncomfortable. Um, it's supposed to be uncomfortable. It's supposed to wake somebody up. If they're not waking up to that, then something could be wrong regardless. 
So from there, calling 911 and then administering the Narcan or vice versa. Um, again, one dose every two to three minutes. During those two to three minutes, we encourage you to set a timer if you have access to a phone or a stopwatch, just because two minutes can feel like an hour in these emergency situations. Um, so during this time, if you're comfortable and trained to do so, CPR, rescue breathing, um, if not putting the person into recovery position, which there'll be a photo of it in a second, but essentially it's laying somebody on their side with the other arm and leg over for stabilization. This is a safe position for the person to be in. It keeps the airway clear, especially if they were to come up vomiting or something like that when they do reverse. Next slide, please. Just a quick, um, easy way to remember how to respond or how to administer the actual Narcan, the three Ps, peel, place, press. Um, you'll see a photo of it in a second, but each individual dose is individually wrapped. There's a tab on the top corner. So you just peel that tab, placing it using your pointer middle and holding on the plunger with your thumb. You're gonna put it into the person's nostril until your fingers hit the bottom of their nostril and then press that plunger. Next slide, please. So walking it through again, step-by-step. Step. Um, so you're checking for signs of overdose. They're not responding. Um, you're putting, you're gonna do that um, filter rub or sternal rub, excuse me. Um, they're still not responding. Next slide, please. From there, you can see it here. Again, it's a step. Um, if that does not work and they're still not responsive after that, you would then call 911. Next slide and then administer Narcan or vice versa. Again, like I had said, you can see exactly what those doses look like. There are two doses in every kit. Each dose is individually wrapped. There's like a plastic on one side with a tin foil backing. Again, you peel that tab using your pointer and middle. You hold the dose with the thumb on the plunger. You put it up into the person's nostril until, they're, until your fingertips hit the bottom of their nostril and then push that plunger. Next slide. When doing so, best practice is to put the person flat on their back. Um, and then from there, getting a tilt in their head, so making sure to support the head when you're doing so. And then again, pointer middle thumb into the nostril and pushing that plunger. Next slide, please. Making sure that at this time, the person's mouth is clear to prevent any choking. And then at that time after administration, if you are comfortable and trained to do so, CPR, rescue breathing, next slide. If not, putting the person into recovery position, which you can see here again, it's on their side with the other arm and leg over for stabilization. Next slide. After those two to three minutes, you're going to check for responsiveness, pulse and breathing. If that person is still unresponsive and you're not seeing um, respiration, you would then repeat this cycle and repeat this cycle every two to three minutes until that person wakes up. EMS arrives, um, or hopefully this would never happen, but you run out of Narcan. Even when that person does wake up, please stay with them until EMS arrives. Um, you are there to comfort them, but also you're there as a resource for EMS. Um, and please try not to throw anything away at that process um, because the EMS can know exactly what you gave that person for medication during your response. Next slide, please. And let's watch a little video for just a little more repetition. Nine one one, what's your emergency? Thank you so much. Um, so aftercare is crucial here. When somebody does wake up, they will be in withdrawal. This could look like a variety of different things depending on the person, what they've taken, how much they've taken. Um, you can think of withdrawal as the flu on steroids. So it could be nauseousness, irritability, vomiting, headaches, et cetera. Another reason why that recovery position is so safe for that person to be in, if they do come up vomiting, they won't choke if they're in that position. 
important if possible to stay calm, give them the facts. Hey, you've overdosed, there's help on the way. Um, you've had some Narcan and then encouraging them to wait for EMS just to make sure that they get checked to make sure all is okay with the biggest reason that that Narcan can wear off um, and they can go back entirely into overdose. Next slide, please. So there is the steps of response, um, moving into the Good Samaritan law, which goes hand in hand with responding to overdose. Um, the Good Samaritan law protects individuals who are either responding or experiencing an overdose. Um, it went into effect with this uh, in this way in August of 2022. So it now protects anyone that is quote unquote rendering aid. That could be as simple as holding a pillow under somebody's head. The goal being that no matter where you are or what you're doing, you're going to call 911 and make sure that that person um, does not die from an overdose. If you want to learn some more about that law, um, you can go to the options resource there, and that'll talk about some more specifics around that. Next slide. And then there is my contact information. Thank you so much. Lauren, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of questions. Lauren is going to remain on the call and we will have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers after um, we complete the presentation. We're gonna move on to the main learning results and talking about that um, and uh, health education standards. Um, welcome Susan Berry, thank you for being here today and talking about this. Thanks, Tammy. Um, hello, everybody. It's nice to see everyone. And I just want to say thank you so much to Lauren. That was a great presentation with um, really good information that we all need. And the repetition part's not a bad thing at all, I must say. <laughs> but naloxone education, and, and including the administration instruction, fits right within health education. It's just a natural fit within it. Um, just wanted to say that before delivering any lessons, educators should find out who and what their local resources are related to naloxone availability and administration and be able to utilize local resources um, because we know that it's really great when we can make those connections in the classroom with our local resources. So the main learning results, health education standards. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, are just listed here, not expecting everybody to read them, um, but they cover the content needed for health education in, in uh, standard one. And then standards two through six are skills that we want to teach our students and make them aware of. Many of you are already aware of these. And so naloxone education connects obviously with number one, because we have information we want to share but also with standard two, wanting students to practice health enhancing behaviors and avoid or reduce risk for themselves or others. Also that they need to be able to access reliable information and products as well as services that are out there. And also making decisions, um, healthy decisions and health enhancing decisions is important along with communication. So those connect all within um, the Locks on Education Administration. And all of that fits naturally also within a substance use prevention unit. So if a curriculum is being delivered by content unit, that's where it would fit as well. And I also would like to uh, share that for clarification around the language in chapter 41, if naloxone administration instruction is part of the health education curriculum that all students receive, then it doesn't have to, in addition, be delivered within an after-school extracurricular activity, though repetition is a very good thing. So offering it in both the curriculum and in after-school or before-school opportunities is not a bad idea. So just wanting to, what we wanted to do is show how health education, no last one education fits within health education. And we would like to uh, go through the questions now that we have. You want to go to that slide? And what I did was I have collected the questions that were asked in the chat, um, starting with a question that says, I'm curious if athletic directors, trainers, and coaches will also have access to naloxone and potentially similar trainings. Tammy, you want to take that one? 
Um, one second, please. Uh, let's see, I'm sure that athletic trainers, directors, trainers, and coaches will also have access to it. Um, I, I believe that they, that that's a possibility. We don't have any additional trainings, um, uh, planned at this time. Uh, this webinar will be made available, um, to, um, persons that would like to, to watch the webinar. Um, but if that seems to be a need, then yes, I'm sure that we could probably provide additional trainings or work with our substance use prevention and, um, behavioral health and, uh, main general partners to provide additional trainings. And also as a result of this um, webinar and training that we're doing today, we are going to provide um, a, a resource, a slide deck. People, I have two or three questions asking, are the slides going to be available? We're not making this slide deck specifically available, but we are going to take this one and develop one that could be used in a training with students and or other audiences that people want to just make aware of the basics around naloxone education and administration. So that would be available for anyone feeling comfortable sharing the information uh, with the audience, the athletic directors or other audiences as well. All right, thank you, Tammy, for helping with that one. I'll, okay. Can I add one quick note? Please, please. Uh, yes, thank you. For, if you're interested in getting naloxone for your school, uh, you had quite add a question about that for the athletic trainers. Go to that link, get main naloxone, and then from there we can help um, get, get your school kids if they're interested. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, Lauren had shared the map with the different locations. Um, just so depending on where you're from depends on what agency you would reach out to, what um, organization. Is there a resource where teachers could access the prevention games if there are could we uh, share those and are they appropriate with high school level? I'm gonna go to you, Lauren, for that because I think she's referring to some of the games you had in your presentation. Yes, we have a few online versions. We typically do it in person, um, but we're working on building more virtual platforms. So please reach out um, and we can work with you with that. All right, great. And we'll be making this our contact information available for Lauren. And again, I had a couple of questions about accessing the slides after the training um, and again, accessing Lauren's um, slide deck and what's available. So she, we will run by what we share with Lauren to make sure that we're um, not sharing something we shouldn't be sharing and are sharing the appropriate uh, resources as well. I'm going to go back and just check to see if we have any other questions that have come in. Um, and I just want to add to that as additional materials are developed, they will be shared out um, with uh, schools. And I'm going to should I jump ahead, Susan, so we can look at the we have available for them, because that seems to be a question that's common. OK, we have another question, if I can answer that first or I put sure. that out first. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, is Narcan available to students in the halls or must they get it from the nurse's office? So how do they access it in schools? I'm going to throw that to Tammy. Sure. Um, Narc, it, it really depends on your local school district. Um, right now, I know that there are some schools that may have it available for students as needed on a confidential um, basis. Um, yes, so um, I'm not sure that all schools are doing that, but some schools are, and it is okay too. So it's local, local policy. Lauren, could I ask you also if you could share if somebody's wanting to know how to get a hold of naloxone, how do they do that? Go to that getmainnaloxone.org link and fill it out. You'll put a little bit of your personal information, contact information essentially in there um, and what your interest is. And then your local um, person of contact will reach out to you from there. And Lauren, would like you mind dropping that into the chat box? Sense. Sure. That the link, yes. The link, yes, please, thank you. Um, okay, I had another one. I know we've got some more questions coming in and we have time, so we're gonna go through as many as possible. 
Sure. Um, this question says, um, an MD who has children at the school says that many naloxone patients who wake up after administration are combative. What is your experience um, or understanding around that, Lauren? It's potential. Um, I think it's much more, uh, I don't want to say a stereotype, but it's not, it's often viewed as every overdose, somebody will wake up and, at swinging at you. That is does not happen very often. That is potentially somebody could wake up. Um, they will be in a lot of pain. So that could also um, play a component there. But um, with that, we recommend, which I didn't say, um, some physical space there when you do after you do respond and you're waiting for somebody to wake up because um, that can help with that piece too. Great, all right. Trying to keep up with the questions here. Excellent, thank you. Um, has a health class curriculum been updated to include more Narcan information? Do we need parent permission for this um, if it's offered before or after school? Um, I'll handle this one. So in terms of the health education curriculum, it's a local controlled state. So therefore you decide what you include in health education, but we are recommending based on the update to the law that there be education within um, the health education curriculum as again, it fits very nicely within any substance use prevention or a skills-based um, curriculum around the enhancing practices and reducing risk um, components. And for the second part of that, in terms of parent permission, again, that's a local control but if someone is getting instruction in CPR, they're giving instruction in how to use naloxone, they're giving instruction how to use different things that will reduce risk or save a life, it's not necessary. It's again, becomes a local control if it feels like it's necessary um, to do it. If recommendation would be, if there are going to do parent permission around that, it would, even if it's after before after school, it would be one of those, um, more of informing the parents and opting out if they do not want their child involved. And I think it's a good time to, to share in our just our conversation that um, the naloxone education is about helping friends, family members, neighbors, community members, because we don't know at any given time there may be somebody that needs this assistance and help and it's being people being able to know what to do. Again, as Lauren said, first thing is to call 911 and then if they have access, the person has access to naloxone, then to administer the naloxone. Okay, um, next question I have is, does there need to be a collaborative practice agreement signed by the school physician for non-licensed personnel to administer? Tammy, I have an answer, but I want Tammy to, or Lauren to be the ones that answer that. <laughs> Um, for, um, if this is for non-licensed, uh, personnel to administer. Right. Does there need to be a practice agreement for the school visit by the school physician for non-licensed personnel to administer? I'm going to phone a friend. I believe <laughs> that. <laughs> I can say at this time is when schools, um, receive Narcan, through the tier one, tier two distribution um, infrastructure, we get a standing order signed with the physician for that to happen, as well as a memorandum of understanding or MOU. And typically that's through a school administrator in addition to our chief medical officer. Um, and that varies depending on which T1 you work with as far as who signs it. Um, but there's an answer to your question as far as where the physician's involved. And that may change um, now that Aloxone is over the counter. Um, in coming months or years. Tammy, this is Emily. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yep, I just wanted to, that's that's right on, Lauren. Thank you for answering that. Um, that beca because schools have other regulations for medications, any medications, that that collaborative practice agreement right now, yes, it is required for um, unlicensed staff to be administering it. And then that allows you to store it in those publicly accessible locations, like in the AED box or or some staff might even carry it. Hope and, that Emily. and that goes right along with, um, as Emily just highlighted that we had shared in the chat, 
by some um, one or two people, I think that in their school, they are keeping it in the AED cabinet. So it's readily available um, for people to know. And I believe uh, Joe Merrill commented, not true, worked in ER as a nurse, doesn't have, it's rare. I think that's in, um, was in response to the um, convulsions and um, combative behavior and uh, that Lauren's also shared. Am I right, Joe? If I'm wrong, Joe, let me know. If I'm right, then we'll just leave it. Okay, correct. Thank you. Thank, thank um, you, Joe, for sharing your experience too. Yes. Um, I wanted to pop in there too, another um, thought and opportunity to offer naloxone education to students is during um, CPR training. That's a prime time that you can do hands-on kind of um, because you're already teaching them to respond to um, an unresponsive person. So that might be also an opportunity to kind of have a more hands-on teaching experience. And having that combination and understanding of the two um, CPR and naloxone administration, you know, for students to understand how those go hand in hand um, is important as well. And Lori, um, thank you very much, has dropped into the chat um, sample collaborative practice agreements for folks to access there. And all links, and all links and resources will be shared in the follow-up email. So don't worry about missing any. Yes, thank you so, so much for that. Um, if someone ODs in the school, what do students do? Um, Tammy, you wanna do that one or Lauren, would you like to address that? Um, I mean, I it, it would start with, you know, uh, uh, assessing if they are unconscious, um, they would get help. And if naloxone is available, they would potentially give naloxone or get someone that can give naloxone to the student, right? It, dep it, it kind of depends on a lot of situations. Is it maybe an after school program? Um, and there might not be anyone else available, but they may have naloxone. There are a lot of different scenarios here to um, for that question. I If there are adults available and um, they're in the classroom, I would think that the teacher, the educator would be responding to that emergency and um, supporting the students in the classroom and really just trying to give privacy to the student that or or individual that's experiencing the overdose um, while they're um, accessing emergency response uh, initiatives. Do you want to add anything, Lauren or anyone else? Or Madison? Madison. We have yeah. a lot of we have a lot of experts on the on the call. I wouldn't call myself an expert, I guess, but <laughs> I uh, I just put in the chat as well that that's when it's just really important that students know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, where they can find naloxone within their school um, and they're able to kind of be able to talk to their teachers or their health educators um, about experiencing overdoses. This is and Emily. And okay. I would just also add that, um, you know, what what are your students told to do when there's any life-threatening emergency that they witness, um, it would be this, it would be treated the same, I would think, you know, they, they're they told to get help. Um, so. Call think, nine one one. Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I said in call 911, go ahead and Lauren. Definitely call 911. And then I would add, this would be a plug as far as your training goes, as you develop this to offer to students, make sure that that is included as an objective and kind of a conversation for students. Absolutely. The, what are the protocols? And I yeah. think as Emily was saying, what are the protocols for any, any type of emergency? And then you just reiterate those when you're talking about naloxone education and administration. So um, all questions are um, important. So we have, would parents need to sign permission for administration like they do for standing orders at the beginning of the school year? So I'm going to tag Tammy and or Emily for that one. And that, that, again, goes back to local policy. It's an emergency drug that would be available. 
um, they may offer for parents to um, complete a permission slip. Uh, however, I, I think it would be like another um, if you if the Good Samaritan laws again would play a role there um, and it, not to hesitate. Go ahead, Emily. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I know that you know the answer, Tammy, but, um, <laughs> and I don't even know if you can see me or if you're looking out my window, but um, that that they wouldn't necessarily have to sign a permission form for, for an emergency medication because of the Good Samaritan law. And um, if you have something that could potentially save their life on hand and you don't use it, you might actually be in more trouble for not using it if, since it was there. So um, it's complicated, but parents don't necessarily know that their children are even using. So they are not going to necessarily sign permission form for that. Very good. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat> uh, someone commented they had an EMT come to my, their school to do a training. And he said that the same thing that we're, um, we've been hearing, they usually are not happy when they wake up. So that was in, co in comment um, around the combative behavior. But I think also just reiterating your local EMTs are a great resource. Um, educators in the school, school nurses, it's important for students to see them and know what they're sharing the information, but also outside resources and knowing who those resources in their community are is very important. So I think that's definitely something an EMT could come in and cover. So I'll put one more call out. If there are any other questions, you can drop those in the chat. And um, meanwhile, I'm going to have uh, Tammy go on. Well, yeah, you want to look on at to the resources. Sure. Okay. If I can get to them. So, in terms of resources, what um, what we'll be doing is we've had a number of questions about the slide deck. As I said, we'll what we're going to do is create a slide deck from the ones that Lauren has and share those um, out with everybody and put them on their, our website. So Tammy, can you take us to the webpage? Is that possible? Uh, my, we... I'm gonna have to re stop share and reshare. So just hang with me. So we do have resources posted on the um, School Student Support School Health website under the acute care. And that's what Tammy's going to pull up and show us. And so in that on that page, you have different resources you can access, including there are a couple of links to lessons that could be used or modified for the classroom. Um, health educators are great at making lessons come to life. So these are they have information and resources in them in these lessons that can be utilized with the students and engage the students in their learning. Just waiting for Tammy to share her screen. Thanks. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I wanted to, it's easier to talk when I'm looking at everyone. So <laughs> it messed with my presentation mode. So thank if you. you. Is it possible to make that just a little bit larger? But you can see it and scroll to the top of the page for me, Tammy. Yes. Okay. Okay. So. so so when you click on the page, this is a page you're going to come to, the School Health Services Acute Emergency Care, and then you'll scroll down to the opioid response section. Um, overdose um, reversal page. And again, you have resources right here that you'll want to go to this page and um, peruse it. I'm going to drop it, the link to it in the chat right now as well. Thank um, you, Susan. Sure. Can I can I also just add Please. here the yeah. um, the main naloxone distribution initiative is also linked on this page um, that Lauren had uh, talked about earlier, where you can access the form to um, get naloxone. Right. Excellent. 
So again, you'll, okay. you'll receive these resources and links to these resources in a follow-up email also, um, along with directions to where you'll be able to find the recording of the webinar. So I'm gonna just pause one more time. Um, are the naloxone training materials available for schools to use? I'm assuming, Yvonne, that you're talking about the um, training materials that Lauren shared. There on the on the resource page that we just shared, there are a couple of programs, um, one by the CDC and one by the National Institute on Drug Abuse that are age appropriate for adolescent education. And you can um, use information contained on those web pages for for educating students in in your um, in your classrooms and, and school communities. There is also staff education there that, that staff can do independently um, from the CDC. Uh, there are many modules that they can work through in their own time. And I believe they also can get some contact hours or, or something from accessing those as well. Speaking yeah. of that, I am gonna put the contact hours link in the chat. Thank you. And I'm gonna, take a step out on the limb here and say that if you have some background that you feel com confident in sharing this information with um, your staff and your coworkers, then reaching out to um, Lauren and talking about what is available, the resources, looking at the ones that we're gonna share, seeing if you're getting enough information from those that you can utilize that and share this. Absolutely, that's why we did this as a train the trainer so that you can go and you can share this information with other people using parts of this video, um, sharing parts of the webinar or all of the webinar with other folks so that they get the information. Those are all options that you have for utilizing materials. So thank you for asking Yvonne. And we do have, again, as Tammy just said, dropped into the chat is a link to your contact hour. So you wanna uh, grab that. And you have access to the slide deck too. We have to change a couple of things um, for the hospital protocol, but other than that, that'll be a resource available for schools. Yes, and that's why we aren't saying that we're going to just share this one right out because we do have to follow protocols um, of what we're making available and we'll be sharing a P what we do share will be a PDF for folks to have um, access to. So Please I'm not, be patient mm -hmm. with um with the resources. Uh, we will have the webinar uploaded to the Department of Education YouTube um, page, and, and we'll and provide that, the link. And and provide the link, and that might take about a week to get it uploaded. So it might be about a week before we get all the resources out to everyone. But definitely, they are coming. Yes. So we want to thank you all for being here today, and as we wrap up the webinar, um. What we hope you found was some new information or updated information on the uh, uh, updates to Chapter 41. And for those, again, who might have joined us a little bit later, Chapter 41 was about CPR in the AED training um, being offered to students or education being offered in the schools. And what has been added to that now is the naloxone um, education and administration instructions. We had a very wonderful um, presentation from Lauren uh, Hunt uh, from Maine General, um, who is a naloxone educator. I'm, that's not her title, it's in the presentation. <laughs> She's a harm reduction coordinator. Um, and thank you so much, Lauren, for being with us and sharing your knowledge um, with the group. We looked at how naloxone education fits within um, health education and aligns to the Maine Learning Results Health Education Standards. And we have highlighted some materials that are available on our website and let you know that we do have more coming um, your way and that will be put on the website. Again, a little bit of grace and patience with getting up the follow-up email. It'll be in the next couple of days by the end of the week um, that you'll receive that. And we might just be a little bit longer with the um, webinar on the YouTube page. So please make sure that you grabbed the contact hour link out of the chat. Um, and again, thank you all for being with us today. 
we appreciate that. We have a couple of other notes that have been dropped in here um, into the chat. Trying to look here. Um, so John Reynolds from the mobilizer mobilizerecovery.org um, do, also does naloxone education through Maine uh, General. Um, looks like in collaboration with Lauren. <laughs> And she's the best, the good, good uh, shout out there. So, well, again, we'll share any additional information that we have in the chat that we might have overlooked. So thank you all for being here and for joining us. Does anyone else have, want to add before we sign off? Thanks everyone for coming today. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate the great turnout and um, all that was shared. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.